get to introduce my wonderful colleague, Mary Helen Specht. Yay! Her debut novel, Migratory Bird, uh, sorry, Migratory Animals, which I actually own more than one copy of, was an editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review and the Austin American Statesman, an Indie Next pick, and an Apple iBook selection. Migratory Animals also won the Texas Institute of Letters Best First Fiction Award and the Writers League of Texas Best Book of Fiction. A previous Fulbright Scholar to Nigeria and Adobe Paisano Fellow, Speck is an Associate Professor of Creative Writing at St. Edward's University. So thanks again, everyone, for coming, and thanks to Melbourne for hosting us. You guys should buy a lot of books before you leave. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read something from a totally new project. Nothing from this has been published yet. Um, and I've got a lot of allergies, so I'm not going to read it in kind of like a Bob Dylan accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so this is the opening of a book. And the opening is set at Burning Man. And some of you guys might be familiar with Burning Man. Um, festival out in Black Rock Desert where there's like, you, you can't even use money, everything has to be gifted. And um, so the protagonist is this middle aged musician who um, has been forced to go there to play a show. And something bad is going to happen, it's kind of the premise for the, for the rest of the novel. So this is just kind of a tip from the beginning. Dusk, pastel light refracted by clouds of fine white sand. The world bathed in a golden halo. Maybe Black Rock Desert was better in photos than in real life, because even with the steampunk goggles and handwoven scarf gifted to her, as was the only unit of exchange here by a woman dressed as a unicorn, <laughs> Jenny Sweet felt under attack by beautiful dirt, digging into wherever cloth touched skin, fusing with the membranes of her lungs and eyes. And the thirst, she could drink an ocean. In the distance, luminous objects stood against the dying sky, a temple filigreed in silver and gold, tiered like a gilded wedding cake, an arcing set of prongs like the rib cage of a whale, a two-story Doc Martin boot attached to a clothesline. Was it for the old woman who lived in the shoe, the one with all the children? The temperature dropped like a sigh of relief. Ginny looked off stage for her daughter to see if anyone had thought to put a jacket on her. Of course not. There she was, one of the roadies by the edge of the makeshift soundstage, twirling cords of glowing neon plastic, mesmerized by the cheap noodles of rainbow light. Ginny watched her guitar tech finish tuning her left paw before clicking it back into the stand. This gig, if you could even call it that, had been Langston's idea to promote their new album with a surprise set at Burning Man. To Ginny, it seemed like a lot of trouble for a show with no tickets, no take. The crowd hadn't recognized them yet. Everybody else on the playa was dressed more like a rock star than they were. <laughs> Nico, she pointed to her daughter's bag with a tower of bottled water they packed in with them. Hoodie, please, it's getting cold. Her daughter frowned, clearly not wanting to cover up the sequined dance costume she'd insisted on wearing. But she did as she was told, pulling the purple sweatshirt from the backpack and squirming into it with syrupy movements, limbs so liquid it was as if she had yet to grow bones. A man climbed the stage, microphone feedback, speaker reverb. Across the way, Langston was signaling something to her that they would have to go on soon. The man was apparently introducing them to a surprised and quickly gathering hive of desert people. <laughs> Ginny found the, the candy apple red noise canceling headphones and nestled them onto Nico's ears, handing her a stack of manga before kissing her on the cheek, smearing a patina of sand across her daughter's skin. I'm hungry. Quickly, Ginny squatted and rifled through Nico's backpack but didn't find anything edible. Can you wait? Nico pursed her lips and pointed at a tent 50 yards away. There's pizza over there. Ginny sighed, straight there and straight back, okay? On stage, Ginny took her place between Langston and Patrick. 
They didn't have a front man, per se, but people liked to see a woman at the center, a little TNA, a little window dressing. Though Ginny tried not to think of it that way, dressed as she was in a plain t-shirt and billowy tie fisherman's pants. Plus, she played the axe like a killer, didn't she, and wrote some of the songs. The Night Jars were an indie band. One of the reasons Langston thought this venue would be a good fit, that over the years had somehow been elevated into fame. They weren't so young anymore, and neither were their fans, but they were still fucking cool. In fact, that's what people said when they spotted her or Langston on the street. Fucking cool, man, fucking cool. <laughs> and that's what the burners were saying now, as they yelled and swarmed, kicking up dust into their glittery faces and writhing bodies. Fucking cool, man, it's the night jars. The night jars are right there, man, they're home. Fuck yeah. <laughs> The acoustics were shit, and Ginny didn't even want to think about what the sand was doing to the equipment. It was like playing a concert in a dust storm. There was something surreal about the lines of tents in the distance, like the desert base of a post-apocalyptic warlord. Temporary community building. That's what people called it. And Ginny couldn't help roll her eyes. How people spent days in a line of cars just to be in the heat and sand and thirst with thousands of strangers. Despite their music's modest success, she still liked to think of them as an art house band. But if this desert carnival is what people considered cutting edge art, then maybe not. Maybe she was better off just losing herself each night in the music. Then at least she could close her eyes on the world, on the undercurrents of her troubled family and troubled band, on the ways in which she hadn't come through intact. Ginny put on the goggles which blocked her peripheral vision. She was suddenly a kid looking through the cardboard tube of a roll of paper towels, or through a kaleidoscope, colors shifting and glimmering into arrays of stained glass. She became her father, who spent one summer driving without a windshield, just goggles between him and the road ahead. Her father, who never saw Jenny perform. Growing up, it had just been the two of them, and maybe that was why Jenny's father had felt the need to compensate. Dressing her in tutus and those god-awful blue-gunned hair bows some other kid's mother was always making and selling. <laughs> One day she found his old goggles from that road trip in the attic, and she wore them until the hardened rubber finally crumbled and broke. After the set, stepping down from the stage felt disorienting. The amp feedback echoed, and Ginny struggled to find her guitar case, tripping over a snake of chords. She shivered and looked around for her leather jacket. Her skin stretched tight across her neck and cheekbones. Her lips cracked and bled. Then Langston was beside her, and she ankled her head for a kiss, but instead he leaned into her ear, where's Nico? Ginny swiveled toward the steps and the undulation of roadies and fans. No candy apple red headphones, no purple hoodie. Did you lose her? asked Langston. Lately, he was so easy to annoy, to blame her for things. You mean, did we lose her? Even in her mild panic, she couldn't help but correct him. Instinctively, they circled the stage in opposite directions, checking in with their crew, shaking off people who tried to stop them or pat them on the shoulder with, great show, great show. Ginny jogged to the pizza tent but it was empty, out of pizza. She tried to see the surroundings through the eyes of a five-year-old. Flames shot up, describing ornate designs in the night sky. Fire torment. Maybe they had learned, lured Nico away, she thought, moving in that direction, passing a phalanx of revelers, naked bodies covered in gold paint and elaborate feathered headdresses, people sporting leather jumpsuits and superhero costumes and furry boots. Ginny remembered getting lost in the grocery store as a kid. But Burning Man was no grocery store. She tasted the copper of adrenaline in the back of her throat. I'm gonna stop there. <laughs>